Welcome everyone to the Sheep Concurrent Session. My name is Kayla and I'll be chairing this session. So I just want to run through a few little housekeeping things. If you've got some questions, we'll be taking questions after the end of each presentation. Uh, if you could type your questions in the Q&A section, uh, not in the chat forum, in the Q&A please. Um, and we will answer as many questions as we can. Uh, if we miss any, we'll try and work out something a bit later. Um, and if anyone has any problems to send Tony a message if you're unable to see anything or anything like that. So I'll um, get straight off because we've got a busy session here today. Uh, first up, uh, if we could have Tom turn on your video, thank you. Tom uh, is an animal science honours completed and he returned to the family farm after that to work out why lambs were not growing as fast. Following on from that, he decided to take on a PhD, which he's currently doing at the moment, and he will present on finishing lambs, optimising preparation and adaptation of lambs to increase feed in intake and subsequent uh, growth rate. Thanks, Kayla. You got me? Yep. Good to go. Okay. Um, I'll get straight into it. Uh, I conducted a, an experiment last year to determine if providing lambs with a feedlot ration prior to feedlot entry would allow the lambs to better transition to the feedlot and improve lamb growth rates. Um, so to do this, I creep fed lambs grain, loosened hay, or a combination of both prior to weaning. Uh, one third of the lambs entered the feedlot straight after weaning and the remainder grazed loosened with half of these lambs having access to grain and feeders before all the lambs entered the feedlot for 40 days during a finishing phase. So lamb growth rates pre-weaning did not differ between creep fed treatments and they averaged about 373 grams per day. Um, and from my calculations, the, the lambs are unlikely to have been able to grow much faster than this uh, during this period. And that was from lamb marking until weaning. What's happened? Um, so the high quality and quantity of feed available to the ewes and lambs was likely responsible for the, the low intakes of the, of the supplementary grain and hay. And these results indicate no benefit in weight gain from creep feeding lambs grazing high quality and quantity of feed. Uh, creep feeding did have an effect on post weaning growth rates. However, these results possibly indicate an area in measurement rather than actual treatment effects. Um, you can see here the, the grain creep fed treatment post weaning their growth rates were were much higher than the the hay creep fed treatment however neither of these treatments was significantly different from the control and also if the grain was truly having a, an effect here you'd you'd likely see this hay and grain treatment group also be significantly different from the control and from the other treatments which it wasn't post weaning growth rates were lower for lambs weaned directly into the feedlot than lambs grazing loosen and that was regardless of whether they had grain or not so supplementing loosen with grain during this period did not increase growth rates. During the finishing, the feedlot period, lamb growth rates were greater for lambs that entered the feedlot immediately post weaning and lambs with access to grain grazing loosen post weaning. So these lambs grazing the loosen were consuming about 300 grams per head per day, which resulted in, in increased intake of the grain in the feedlot. So my take home messages are that creep feeding lambs was not effective in this experiment due to the paddock looking like this. Uh, supplementing lambs post weaning with grain while grazing loosen was not effective because the loosen looked like this. Uh, however, provision of a feedlot ration prior to feedlotting is effective at increasing feed intake and lamb growth rates in the feedlot. However, this was only apparent post weaning with grain intakes of approximately 300 grams per head per day. So if you want to take anything from, from this experiment and, and from this talk, uh, these are definitely the key messages. However, some of you may have noticed that the, the lamb growth rates in the feedlot were not something to get very excited about. Um, and this is a very important observation. And the reality of feedlotting lambs is sometimes that it just doesn't go as you might expect. So what happened in the feedlot? Well, the short answer is uh, I'm not really sure. Um, if you do some calculations, you use a program like GrazFeed or something like that, um, using the quality of the diet and how much the lambs ate, uh, it'll tell you that they should have grown at about 280 grams per head per day. 
Uh, however, the observed growth rates of the of the fastest growing treatment was 147 grams per day, and the slowest treatment actually only grew at 80 grams per day. Uh, so I asked other lamb feedlotters what their growth rates were, uh, and the majority told me they were between 250 and 400 grams per day. They also told me that the, the ratio of feed intake to live weight gain is between four to one and six to one, whereas the lambs in my trial were at, uh, about 10 to one. Uh, so I decided to look a bit, bit further into this, uh, and I did some modeling of lamb growth based on intake. Uh, and this blue line here represents what is possible in an environment uh, with no constraints on intake and a high quality diet, which in theory is what a feedlot should be able to provide. The orange line shows how my lambs should have performed based on their intake and the, and the quality of the diet. And the gray line, which sorry is hidden by the, by the yellow, is, is how the lambs actually performed. So changing a number of inputs in this particular model, such as the digestibility of the diet and the maintenance requirements of, of the animals could help explain why the, the lambs perform so poorly. Uh, but the, the one input that I changed that stood out to me was the efficiency of protein deposition. And when I reduced the efficiency in which the lambs utilise the energy to grow, their predicted performance was much more accurate, which is the yellow line here. Uh, so why did I do this? And what does what reduced efficiency even mean? So as a lamb grows, it deposits energy as both protein and fat, and protein is shown by the, the solid blue line and fat shown by the solid orange line. Um, and down the bottom here, you've got the lamb's age in days. So the, the peak of protein deposition happens early in maturity, whereas fat deposition, the peak happens later, and, and they're putting on fat much later in the maturity as well. And these lines here show the genetic potential for this lamb's growth. So they can't actually put on protein or fat above these lines at each stage of maturity. On this other figure here, we've got the, the lamb's intake in multiples of maintenance. So one is, is maintenance intake, two is two times maintenance, three times maintenance, etc. Uh, and on the side here, we've got retained energy. So at zero retained energy, the lamb's not putting on any weight. It's, it's at maintenance. And as retained energy increases, it, it puts on either protein or fat. So as you increase the lamb's intake, it starts to, do, its first priority is to meet its maintenance requirements. It then begins to deposit protein. And then when intake levels get high enough, it starts to deposit fat. So if I was to restrict a lamb at say two times maintenance, it would put on most of the protein that it wants to put on, but it puts on very little fat. Um, and that's shown by these dotted lines in the, in the first figure where the protein is almost reaching what it, what it wants, whereas the fat peak shifts and they're actually putting on a lot more fat later in maturity. So as I shift from 100% protein in the game, which is the far right, the one down the bottom, um, to 100% fat in the game, which is the zero, ruminants actually become much more efficient at, at utilizing the energy. So at 100% fat in the game, they're something like 75% efficient, whereas 100% protein in the game, they're about 20% efficient. Um, so this is one reason that we see what we see in feedlot fed cattle, which is after they have a period of restriction, their, their compensatory gain is, is much faster and more efficient because during the, the moderate restriction, they've put on most of the protein that they want to put on, but very little fat. And then when the feed becomes available, they the, most of the composition of the gain is fat, so they're much faster and more efficient at, at utilising their feed. Um, however, compensatory gain is also a result of increased gut fill and the reduced maintenance requirements from following changing from a from a low feed intake to a high feed intake. Um, so I want to stress to you that I'm not advising you to restrict a young animal's growth um, as this just creates problems. However, but if you if you plan on feed loading, there is potential that moderate growth prior to entry into the feedlot could result in better feed conversion in the feedlot, but there's still a fair bit of work that needs to be done and, and other factors could be playing a part, such as the digestibility of the diet and the maintenance requirements of the animal. Uh, so if I'm just making sure I haven't lost you there. So uh, the observed poor growth in this trial is likely a result of, of a one or a combination of these three things that either the low efficiency of the growth, 
a, a lowly digestible diet or the high maintenance requirements of the animal. And as ruminants consume energy, their first priority is to meet maintenance. They then begin to deposit protein. And then once intake levels get high enough, they'll start to deposit fat. And protein growth is, is not very efficient, whereas fat growth is highly efficient. Um, so there's still more work to do, and I certainly don't have the evidence to tell you which of these three things was playing the most part in the in the poor growth in this in this experiment. And and finally, I just want to say, don't restrict your animal's growth. Um, it's it, it can have health and welfare implications, and and could even result in stunted growth where the animal doesn't ever reach its mature weight. Um, and this is just a, a picture of a lamb getting CT scans, which is how we look at the how they deposit protein and fat as they're growing. Um, so that's, that's all I've got. Thank you very much, Tom. Do we have any questions for Tom today? Doesn't look like it. Very great presentation there, uh, Thomas. Uh, we'll move on to our next presenter, who is Gordon. I'll just bring up Gordon's slides now. If Gordon, you could pop up on the screen. Gordon is a research scientist in small ruminant production. He's done a lot of work in neonatal lamb autopsy and has developed a prototype measure body condition score. Gordon will present on heat stress, reducing sheep reproduction rate. Thanks, Kayla. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to start by thanking the Graham Centre for inviting me to speak to the Sheep Forum today uh, and the audience for your time and attention. Throughout my presentation, I have included images of the most commonly researched mammalian species from which our knowledge about hay stress is derived. So I hope you enjoy those images as they occur. The cost of heat stress to the Australian sheep industry has been estimated to range recently between $97 and $168 million per annum. It is a difficult task to estimate this cost, and the estimates rely on assumptions around when sheep are mated, how many and where they are. Other than the current cost estimate, the other main take-home messages from that report are the considerable gaps in our knowledge and that the economic impact of the issue is set to increase with climate change. What is heat stress? All animals have their own body temperature, and that's called the set point temperature. In sheep, that temperature varies between individuals ranging from 38 and a half to 39 and a half degrees. Very serious issues occur in the cells of the body when body temperature exceeds 41 and a half degrees. This means for sheep, there is little room between normal body temperature and hyperthermia. And therefore, the weather forces the animal to, to shed heat from its body at warm temperatures, not hot temperatures. When ambient temperatures rise, the need to expel metabolic heat increases. So heat stress can be defined as the point when the weather requires heat loss from the animal. Set point temperature is usually higher in species that are more productive, particularly those looking for growth and muscle, because they eat more. How, mammal, how mammals manage their own body temperature is through a process called thermoregulation. Mammals create their own body heat through digestion and metabolic activity. Through response pathways, they can also adjust their behaviour, their metabolism and physiology to maintain core body temperature. The first changes we observe in a heat stress sheep is increased shade seeking, increased respiration rate, water intake and sweating, and then reductions in feed intake. We can observe these changes, but we can't easily see changes in heart rate, or changes in blood flow or physiology. Sheep will dissipate about 60% of their heat via respiration. So you can judge heat stress and its impacts on your animals by counting breaths per minute. With respect to the physiological changes that occur in sheep uh, due to heat stress, with respect to reproduction, centres around the most important hormone, which is gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, GNRH. This hormone kicks off a cascade of other hormones that result in the development of sperm and eggs and sexual activity. GNRH can be reduced in concentration 
when animals enter a negative energy state, which can arise following prolonged heat waves, forcing reductions in feed intake and weight loss. High stress conditions lead to cortisol secretion also, which when it increases, further reduces gonadotrophin releasing hormone. And heat stress also has direct effects on GnRH. So the governor hormone can be suppressed by heat stress in a number of ways, and the flow on effects are numerous. At the cellular level, other negative impacts of heat stress will occur. And this is through the production of oxygen radicals. The production of oxygen radicals is a normal byproduct of metabolism and not a problem because the body has defenses to manage them. That defense system is antioxidant enzymes and antioxidant minerals that work together to mop up excess oxygen radicals. However, damage occurs to the cells of the body when the production of oxygen radicals exceeds the cell's antioxidant capacity. Heat stress increases the production of oxygen radicals and decreases the production of antioxidant enzymes. In the context of reproduction, sperm, ovarian follicles and ova are very sensitive to oxygen radicals. Taking this information together with that of the previous slide, we have a picture that says both chronic and acute heat waves are going to challenge sheep, particularly sensitive reproductive tissues and hormones. To understand how much heat is required to affect reproduction, researchers have used climate control facilities for greater control. These historical experiments have greatly expanded our knowledge. For example, nine hours at 41 degrees temperature at the time of AI has resulted in total reproductive failure. But it is the observations made in the real world that are most intriguing. Two studies, the first undertaken 50 years ago and the second 30 years ago, both show a negative correlation between temperature above 32 degrees during mating and flock fertility. That graph is from the study 30 years ago, and it shows a 2.7% reduction in fertility when the average number of days during mating that exceeded 32 degrees increased. This suggests that a mating period that has every day above 32 degrees is likely to result in flock fertility around 78%. And if there were no days above 32 degrees, fertility would be 96%. Most people would expect that heat stress is more important for its effects on rams, which is right in one sense. An infertile ram is a problem, and an infertile syndicate of rams is a catastrophe. However, while the effects on the ram uh, impact sperm production and sexual activity, once the ewes are mated and pregnant, the ram's job is done. However, for the ewe, in addition to expressing sexual behaviour and producing a quality egg and permitting uh, the embryo to implant, they are also required to develop a quality placenta with appropriate blood flow, gestate a normal birth weight lamb and provide adequate milk quality and milk production. The progeny of heat stress use have lower birth weights, increased mortality, lower fleece weights and fewer secondary, uh, secondary wool follicles. None of these effects are favourable, and so how the ewe manages heat affects fertility, the pregnancy, the progeny, and their production. When reproduction can be uh, impaired at temperatures above 32 degrees, let's look at what that means in the context of Wagga's long-term temperature record. That record shows increases in the number of days above 32 degrees, above 35 degrees, and here in the graph on the left, 40 degrees. When we consider heat stress thresholds, such as the one that's in the middle, that's recording uh, extreme heat stress days using temperature and humidity index, those extreme conditions are also starting to increase. And so too is the frequency of heat stress persisting overnight. For me, this means that yes, while heat stress is a normal part of life, in the past it was more important to producers in some environments, but that's changing. And it is certain that heat stress will be a factor in more environments and for longer periods of time in the coming decades and centuries. What that means for sheep producers is that several mitigation strategies will need your consideration, including modifying the nutrition, management and genetics. But there is a catch. Currently, there are no proven nutritional strategies that will minimise heat stress impacts on sheep reproduction. There are several candidates available for research as their effects in prime lambs include supporting feed intake, lowering respiration rate, 
and body temperature and minimising the metabolic consequences of oxygen radical damage on meat quality. Those studies focus on boosting dietary antioxidant levels. In dairies, it's not uncommon to see sprinkler systems wetting cows to enhance heat loss via evaporation. Large expanses of shade are typical for beef feedlots, but for sheep, there is no standard. In fact, the amount of shade a sheep requires is unknown, but we do know that providing shade for use in late pregnancy lessens the negative effect of hot environments on lamb birth weight and survival. Elsewhere, providing shade in autumn, even when it wasn't hot, has led to higher wean weights. Time of shearing is another area that doesn't have a great deal of research surrounding it for effects on heat uh, and reproduction. Only a few studies globally examine the genetics of heat tolerance. Some breed focused studies, some milk genetics studies in dairy, uh, Mediterranean dairy sheep, for example, and these listed heritability estimates produced for Australian merinos. The Australian data is encouraging because the heritability estimates for temperature and respiration rate in younger sheep are moderately high. However, there are no genetic estimates for the correlated relationships with the main production traits. These graphs on the screen report relationships between ewe body temperature collected after mating in midsummer at Julia Creek in Queensland and show lower birth weights in lambs born to ewes with higher body temperatures and the progeny subsequently producing lower fleece weights. These phenotypic relationships are compelling and will surely have some genetic basis. This is my last slide. The take home messages here are unfortunately simplistic but logical. On the bright side, our levy funded R&D agencies, AWI and MLA, have in the last year placed heat stress effects on sheep reproduction into their relevant strategies. There is low hanging fruit to research. The key thing for producers to note is that the adoption pathway is a long one. The average amount of time between the aha moment of discovery and peak adoption is about 30 years. And in the context of a rapidly changing climate, that isn't very long. On this issue, it is increasingly important that researchers and producers work together to find readily adoptable solutions. So keep watching that space. And that's the end of my presentation, Kayla. I've left plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordon. That was a great presentation. Some very interesting things there about. Um, we've got a few questions come in for you. James has asked, is there any known physiological differences that improve the sheep? Uh, Kayla, you just dropped out a little bit at the end there. Can you repeat that question, please? Yep. Is there any known physiological differences that improve heat tolerance in sheep? Known physiological differences that improve heat tolerance. Yes, of course. Uh, so, uh, there's, there's a lot of physiological pathways. Uh, there's a number of hormones that will allow, uh, you know, uh, the opening of the vascular system to allow sh uh, heat to shed and circulate around, or circulate around the body. Um, animals that are adapting to heat stress tend to be taller and leggy, uh, have more bare area, longer ears, for example. If we consider the subtropical sheep species, they're not really terribly productive compared to large Australian sheep. Um, so there, there are differences, there are pathways that we could examine. Uh, I think really the, the important thing sitting in behind the answer there for you, James, uh, is that there hasn't been a great emphasis in the last 20, 30 years looking at the, the importance of heat stress and its effect on reproduction, particularly in relation to the correlated genetic traits. So we are making the assumption that selecting animals for greater productivity uh, in our uh, hot Australian environment uh, includes indirect selection for heat stress. But unless you're making that selection under conditions of heat stress, that's probably an error. Thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, I've got a few more questions um, from Madeline. Do we know if there is an optimum wool amount, i.e. three, four, six months full wool to reduce the stress? Yeah, wool's a great insulator and it's a great question. Thanks, uh, Madeline. The, so wool length is, uh, it is um, it's a paradox. So freshly shorn sheep are very exposed to solar radiation and they will struggle in the days or weeks after being shorn. When Once you've got around perhaps one to two inches of wool length, 
uh, you're in that ideal comfort zone where the heat can still escape from the animal. As the wool length starts to increase, as you get close to full wool, uh, probably the traditional 100 mil kind of length, uh, the wool starts to become an insulator and traps heat around the body of the animal. So it can't lose heat out of its body through convection when air runs across the body. They've got to do things like sit down on cool ground, drink more water or reduce their feed intake or seek more shade. So wool length is good and can be bad. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, we've got another is there more chance of fetus survival at different trimesters? Yes, yeah, so there's no documented evidence that fetuses are going to be lost due to heat stress. That's not documented. It's not in the literature. I hear things from pregnancy scanners that say that they observe um, fetal reabsorption about a couple of weeks after major heat events. Uh, really seriously major heat events, but that's anecdotal. Uh, the impact on the pregnancy outcome really circulates around the time of ovulation. So the impacts are on the follicle, on the ova, and perhaps the very early uh, conceived embryo. So within about three days after conception, the embryo starts to divide sufficiently and it starts to create its own antioxidant system. It, every time it doubles its cell number, it increases its antioxidant capacity. So as the uh, embryo develops, uh, it becomes more and more stable and, and tolerant to heat stress. So the way heat stress affects reproduction is really around sperm and around over and the timing of conception. So it's much more of an issue to AI. Um, once the pregnancy is accepted maternally, it should be fairly robust and there's no evidence to suggest that heat stress very late uh, or any time after that uh, implantation is going to lead to fetal loss. It's not documented. It's possible because blood flow is extremely important. Thank you Matt, very much. And we've got one last question from Faru. What are the nutritional strategies that might help to alleviate effect of heat stress? Well, through that's a really good question. Um, in the literature, there's about 17 or 18 different approaches that we could consider. Um, factors that affect body temperature, for example, feeding uh, in the morning versus feeding in the afternoon might show that you can change body temperature profile. If you feed late in the afternoon, the animal's accumulated heat through the day, and then you feed it and it keeps that uh, digestive heat in its body moving into the night when it wants to be losing heat. So if you fed those animals early in the morning, they would then increase their body temperature at the same time that daytime heat is affecting their temperature. So they just drink more uh, water and seek more shade and it doesn't have the same lasting effect. Then there's uh, minerals such as uh, selenized yeast and vitamin E at super nutritional levels, very, very high uh, levels chromium picolinate, uh, and then of course there's the other minerals such as manganese, zinc, uh, selenium, copper, which all have uh, a role in the multi-min product. Uh, whether multi-min has enough uh, dose rates to actually bring about these important changes or not still needs to be uh, explored. Um, but so there's a number of nutritional options uh, and uh, probably a decade of research to understand the importance of each of those. Thank you very much, Gordon. We'll move on now to Craig. Um, he will be here for Q and A. And um, his um, work is running weather trials for flock ben benchmarking. He provides technical advice and merino genetic consultancy. He's looking at measuring wool and meat traits to define flock genetics. So we've got a video from Craig um, on the importance of genetic benchmarking in the Australian merino industry, and Craig will be here to take questions at the end. So uh, Craig Wilson, um, I'm here to present for the Graham Centre uh, today on <clears throat> genetic benchmarking in the merino industry. So my history is, uh, is largely working with sheep for all of my life. Um, I now run a consulting business across Australia. Uh, a big part of that has been running benchmarking trials, um, some of the largest trials in the country. Uh, we've been doing that for 16 years um, and I hope to be able to present to you some of the findings from those trials. 
So there's a few different ways of benchmarking Merino genetics. Um, they would include uh, some traditional tr uh, weather trials, which are largely run by the New South Wales DPI. That information then gets put into the Merino bloodline comparison, um, which uh, I find a wonderful document. A lot of the stuff that we've done has gone into that into that publication. Um, it's a really truly objective um, form of data. Uh, another way that can be Merino benchmark uh, Merino can be benchmarked is through SOAR evaluations. Uh, these are run across right across Australia um, with linkages that allow SOAR evaluations to compare individual rams. Uh, so this this data is important in an individual sense, but it's not so not so vital as a as a bloodline comparison, in my opinion. Um, the other thing that can be used is Merino Select, which is um, Again, a national database that compares individual animals. Uh, but what I'd like to talk about today is um, is something that's quite close to me. Obviously, is is the weather trials and uh, most particularly the Peter Westblade Memorial Merino Challenge um, that uh, a bunch of us have uh, put together and have been working on for a long period of time. Um, so, why do we benchmark Merino genetics? Um, I guess the reason is to is to differentiate um, what you buy when you're when you're buying rams is you're buying the genes. Um, you're not only buying the rams, but what you need is is what's inside those rams, and that's their genetics. And how do we um, ascertain what's good and what's bad? Um, I think generally, as a as an industry, um, I think we underestimate the importance of environment and management on how genetics perform um, you know to, to separate uh, to separate those two things are, are really hard to do uh, in a in an on-farm situation so we really need to set something up that provides a level playing field um, for those sheep to then measure the difference um, in the actual genetics not just measuring the environment so uh, that's what we've been doing for a long period of time um, again, the information says that we've got up to 60% difference in net profitability uh, in these trials that we run. Uh, this is just a little graph here, or a little table, I should say. Uh, just to work that out, we've used uh, bought two teams of weathers. Uh, they're exactly the same sheep and run them in two very different environments. Um, and the graph clearly highlights uh, the, the range between those two sheep and how the environment <clears throat> certainly does affect how sheep uh, look and how they perform. So my question is, if you have, if you're the owner of um, both of these groups of sheep, um, you know your impression of your genetics could be very could, would be very different. Um, this graph here is something we've put together. Uh, it, it represents 355 um, individual businesses. Um, what we've done there is looked at the second year of data from all the trials that we run. Um, so uh, that's allowed us to, I guess, take out, um, again, take out those environmental and man management factors. And what you're seeing there is the deviation in terms of dollars um, and how, I guess, the thing that stands out to me in that graph is just the range and the opportunity for people to um, to significantly improve the quality of their genetics. Uh, and from there, I guess what I want to talk to now is just what effect that that would have um, on your profitability. So what is the difference between moving from um, team B through to team A? Um, it's quite a unique database because those two teams have 10 years or over 10 years of data and um, I'm just going to walk you through that now. So this table here um, actually represents 10 years of information um, and they're not the same sheep. They're actually five different drops of weathers. Um, again, five different drops run in five different environments. And what the data really shows me um, and hopefully shows you is just the consistency of that information and regardless of the year and regardless of where they've run, um, Team A has been 
has always been significantly finer and always been significantly has always cut significantly more clean wool. Um, so that data there gives me enormous confidence in the in the protocols that we run with the trials that we have. Um, it should give those people that are in the trials uh, really good confidence in in the information that comes back out and and how they can use that data. So I guess this is just another way of, of presenting that that data. Um, again, looking at looking at how that over that period of time, how Team A has been able to consistently um, keep their superiority over Team B, um, regardless of the year, regardless of the season, um, and it also shows over time how those that both teams have actually. Um, improved in that in that fleece value over that 10 year period. So from there, um, what we've done is looked at what effect that that does have um, in a real real life situation. So um, you know, people would say to me, um, you know, Craig, we make the investment of putting the sheep in the trial. Um, you know, we get a lot of information out, but how does it affect our business? So what I wanted to do and show that there is the importance of those decision making, of that decision making. Um, what I would suggest in this data is that the sheep don't, those two teams don't look vastly different. They're, they're very much the same in terms of um, body weight. Um, uh, again, with what we've done here, um, over that 10 year period, um, Team B has slightly more uh, meat value, but uh, those two teams are, to me, a great way of comparison because if you look at it a net profit per DSC, um, the numbers are actually higher because you can run slightly more um, sheep at Team A than you can Team B. So over time, over that 10 year period, the average fleece value of uh, Team A was $59 um, and Team B is $43. So the variance there is um, $15.20 um, and that might not seem a lot to some people, but um, the thing you've got to understand with this data is that, that that will hit the bottom line. So basically the costs of running those two groups of two teams of sheep will, will be the same and um, you may just have to buy some more wool packs. But um, this is this is the information that that we've got here. Um, so again, what's the impact of going to buy those two groups of sheep? Um, so if you were to go to hay, and someone said, "Well, I'm I'm actually going to convert my property uh, from a 100% cropping to to say oh, I've got you know I want to <clears throat> I want to put." 30% uh, of my farm down to pasture. I'm going to need 5,000 um, weathers for that. Um, how do I make that decision? So I guess this highlights the importance of that decision and doing some uh, doing some really good um, investigative work about what you buy. Um, so the so the numbers there largely um, tell me that. Um, you know, in in just in just the first year, um, the difference is um, over sixty-seven thousand uh, dollars on five thousand weathers. Um, but if you looked at it a lifetime of of wool production, and this is just weathers, it's not actually if you're to buy ewes, the the numbers are are higher. Um, but um, you're looking at three hundred and seventy, nearly three hundred and seventy-two thousand um, dollar difference there based on on that one decision so I would have thought in anyone's business that's that's highly significant um, the stuff I would say about all the all the uh, data and all the processing and all the years and years of information that we've got is that um, no one puts sheep no one puts their team of sheep in these trials to prove how bad they are um, we've got 300 and over 350 pushing now 400 individual teams of weathers fully benchmarked and no one's ever said to me, Craig, show me how bad they are. Um, everyone that puts their sheep in these trials all think that they've got good sheep and um, we still see this huge range 
in profitability. So I see that as a, um, a great way for people to um, be more profitable into the future. Um, I would I would say to young people that are buying country, um, make make really strong, sound decisions early because this kind of stuff can set you up into for your future. And um, again, my experience with this with this type of information, where people have put sheep into these trials and then gone home and made uh, made good decisions, changed their ram source, in some cases changed change their entire flock over and then come back and put the progeny of that decision back into the trials, um, there's a distinct um, and significant difference in um, in those sheep, measured difference. And um, for a lot of people that can be the difference between them um, making money, uh, buying their next door neighbour's farm or, you know, I guess missing out on some of the things that they'd like in their lives. Uh, so that's, um, I guess in brief, what I was, um, I've been asked to talk about. Um, I'd certainly like to acknowledge the people that have uh, assisted uh, me in my business um, and they, uh, Australian Wool Innovation has been uh, really good supporters of, of these trials. Uh, without their help, um, I'm pretty sure we couldn't have been able to do it. Um, Moses and Son have been wonderful supporters over a long period of time. Uh, Sally Martin Consulting has been with us all the way through. Um, and the New South Wales DPI looks at all of this data and uh, crunches the numbers for us and always oversees the whole process. So um, thank you to those. Um, uh, thank you to the Graham Centre and Tony for um, inviting me to present this information. A great uh, video there from Craig. So Craig's not available for Q&A at the moment. If you do have any questions, please uh, pop them in the Q&A and Craig will get back to you at another time. Uh, we'll move on now to Susan Robinson. Uh, Susan is a researcher and lecturer at Charles State University and also works on her family property. Susan's research focuses on sheep reproduction, particularly focusing on increasing the number of lambs born and lamb survival. Susan will present on optimising new reproductive performance in containment areas. Okay, thanks Kayla. Hello everyone. Um, now we have heard of quite a lot about containment feeding this morning, which is um, some very uh, uh, good information. Um, my, my talk today is more about um, focusing on breeding ewes and in particular um, increasing the reproductive performance of those ewes uh, in containment areas because obviously um, breeding ewes are usually the, the type of sheep that we have in, um, in those, um, those areas. So the, the key to this, this topic is um, containment feeding. Um, what is best practice um, that we can recommend uh, to producers? And I can't actually see some of my slide. But anyway, um, the, the issue is that um, there's not a lot of data out there on reproductive performance in containment areas. Um, and in particular, there's very limited comparative data that will allow us to uh, recommend um, practices, one practice above another. What we do know is that health risks can be increased by um, in intensive feeding uh, in containment areas and also the fact that it's a drought uh, and that they may be in poorer condition when they come in as well. Typically, um, from the data that's available, the U mortality rates are going to be fairly low in containment if we get things right, uh, so less than 1%. And most farmers, if you ask them, will say that their reproductive performance is normal. Uh, and so that's both your pregnancy and scanning rates uh, and then your lamb marking percentages. Um, we can't tell where losses might occur because um, ewes are not usually in containment for uh, the entire reproductive period. So losses can occur at any time and may be caused by things other than uh, something associated with containment. So most of reproductive performance is normal. Um, we do find um, people that say that uh, in some cases that the uh, lamb, lamb marking rates might be better if, you, if they're managed in containment rather than paddock run. Um, and most likely that's because that the nutritional status of the ewes in the containment area uh, is better than, than those out in the paddock. 
basically you can keep a better eye on them. Um, they're being fed um, to maintenance um, um, and they're just closely observed. And so you can, you can act um, and, and improve nutrition um, before, they, um, before they lose too much. However, there are a couple of reports that say that um, lamb marking percentages might be about 10% lower um, for paddock run use, uh, sorry, for containment use compared to paddock run use. Uh, and that is somewhat concerning. Um, we don't know, there's not enough detail around those reports as to um, what was the cause of that and did something associated with containment um, uh, contribute to it. And then there uh, the odd reports of major failures um, after containment feeding. Um, that is a real concern and that is certainly something that producers need to try to avoid if at all possible because it's going to cost you a, an absolute fortune. So what is the range in um, pregnancy rates after containment? Um, those I have come across uh, both through the literature and through um, talking to producers. Um, pregnancy rates can range from less than 50% uh, up to 97%. So there's a huge range. Um, and if we think that the target, I guess, uh, would be for about 95% of the adult use to be pregnant, um, um, you know, anything less than that, means that there's a little bit of, bit of room for improvement. Um, and particularly, we need to remember that uh, in droughts, um, you know, from preg scanning data, um, you know, in droughts, we tend to have lower pregnancy rates, you know, um, mainly because users are in poorer condition. So the, the key to this, this talk today and this project was, um, so what practices can we recommend uh, that will optimise both the health and reproduction in, in use, um, which are going to reduce our costs and also reduce the risk of, um, of failures. The, the problem is that there's a lot of advice out there, um, whether that's by consultants, um, the farmer down the road, um, and in fact the, um, the uh, publications put out by various um, government organisations. Lots of advice. Um, a lot of it's conflicting advice. So one person says one thing and someone else disagrees. Um, and so um, it's very difficult and very confusing for farmers as to well, what is the best practice. Um, the problem around much of the advice is that there's very limited evidence, um, comparative evidence um, in the literature to actually um, prove that one practice is better than another. Um, so that's what this project was basically about. Um, this this was a project funded by Meat and Lost Australia, um, and it was the aim of it was to provide evidence based guidelines um, that producers could use to improve uh, production and, and reduce the risk. So basically, what we uh, we, we did we reviewed um, the scientific data that's available um, for comparisons between different practices. Um, and therefore, we had solid data, reliable data to, to um, um, show what was better than something else. We then held um, an industry forum in April uh, that included producers, consultants and the research team um, to benchmark what current practices uh, were and what the reproductive performance was uh, out in the industry now, not, not 20 years ago, um, and also to identify and prioritise topics for adoption and gaps in knowledge that could, um, could benefit from further research. And the aim of all that was to be able to uh, develop um, updated guidelines for producers. Um, so we've come up with a whole list of, um, of recommendations. Um, those have been um, provided to MLA and they're being formatted, etc. cetera. Uh, and they will be published on the MLA website um, as soon as possible. So I do apologise for the size of this screen. It's a bit, bit cluttered. Um, but what the key guidelines are, and these are only the key ones, there's a whole, whole lot more which uh, will be available later. Um, I've, I've basically put into three areas. So one is reducing health risks. Uh, one is feeding systems. And the, the, the last one is uh, specific reproductive management. So I'll just run through these. So in terms of reducing health risks, it's really important to vaccinate for clostridial diseases uh, prior to use going into the into the uh, containment area. And pulpy kidney is the key one that we are concerned about. Um, as someone said this morning, uh, monitoring of fecal egg counts uh, and drenching to um, avoid worm uh, issues is also very important. Um, and as also was said this morning, um, the addition of calcium uh, to grain-based diets or cereal 
any cereal type based diet uh, is also very important because they 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 are going to be deficient in calcium otherwise and um with with reproducing ewes particularly going towards late pregnancy and lactation um that uh that can result in 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 um mortalities uh so one and a half percent limestone agricultural limestone added to the diet um and if we're having them in containment during late uh, pregnancy, so the last four weeks of pregnancy, we should also um, think about, or we should, um, as a recommendation, add one and a half, one and a half percent COSMAG uh, to pro provide magnesium, because magnesium requirements increase um, towards late, uh, towards um, lambing, and then in lactation, um, and this will avoid um, mortality or minimise mortalities from um, metabolic diseases. Acidosis is uh, the key risk, which you're no doubt all aware of, and slow introduction to grain um, is, the, is the, the primary means of avoiding that. That includes your rams as well as your ewes. Um, sometimes people forget about their rams, um, and certainly you don't want to um, uh, lose a ram through acidosis or reduce his performance or his sperm production uh, by um, giving a touch of acidosis. That includes changing batches of grain. Um, uh, as well as different types of grain. And that's going to take um, around about two weeks, depending on how much you're going to be feeding them, um, to get them up onto a containment type of diet. The other thing to reduce uh, acidosis is to um, include roughage in the diet, and 10% minimum roughage is uh, what the recommendation is. The other key health risk specific to uh, breeding use is pregnancy toxemia, um, which you might see in late pregnancy. Um, and the key to avoiding that is, again, make sure that you're feeding um, adequate energy for maintenance. Uh, be very careful with um, changes to diet, which might put them off their feed. So a touch of acidosis will put them off their feed and, and then possibly result in preg tox. So uh, managing um, feed supply for late pregnant particularly use uh, is really important. Um, as Bruce said this morning, um, Campylobacter um, can be an issue feeding on the ground, uh, so um, uh, provision of belting or troughing systems can minimise that risk uh, and also consider va vaccination for Campylobacter. One of the key times when problems can occur at, is with release of use from containment, and so uh, the recommendations are um, to vaccinate um, pre-release, so in advance of release, um, particularly for pulpy kidney, um, and to release gradually to to avoid a sudden change in um, in 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 diet. Um, as was also discussed morning this morning, um, having adequate pasture uh, out in the paddock when they are released is really important. Um, and if there's not, um, they're going to require um, continuing adequate nutrition. And again, this is particularly important uh, with releasing late pregnant ewes, which are going to be susceptible to uh, preg tox. So in terms of feeding systems, lots of people use lots of different things and um, many systems work. Um, the key message here though is that simple feeding systems can work, whether that's trail feeding uh, and roughage separate um, um, or other, other variations of that. Okay, you don't need a feed mixer to be successful. Um, daily feeding does increase the proportion of shy feeders. So shy feeders might normally be maybe 5%. Um, and that can increase if if um, if you're feeding daily. So feeding every second, third day is quite successful and reduces the number of shy feeders. Feeding straw rather than hay is also proven to reduce the number of shy feeders. Uh, although I'd just comment that be careful with uh, high proportions of straw in the diet or low quality hay in the diet for late pregnant use when the actual bulk of feed they're actually eating uh, might mean they can't eat enough of it. And again, you, you could be triggering uh, preg tox in late preg. Um, so, um, uh, but straw is, um, is usually cheap. Um, and uh, so um, if you're only including say 10% in the diet, um, um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, um, it's a viable strategy. Do remember to feed test teed, feeds um, so that you know how much to feed uh, to maintain weight and to avoid overfeeding and costing yourself money that's around unnecessary feeding. But remember the feed test is only an estimate um, and ideally you really should um, monitor condition score of the ewes uh, regularly uh, and remove any shy feeders and, and put them back in the paddock, feed them elsewhere um, where they will generally pick up. 
The other thing to be careful of is any toxins or chemical residues in feeds. Um, uh, so, uh, um, you know, get quality assurance on any type of feed you're buying in. Um, but also be aware of uh, putting pens in a place where there's not chemical contamination or toxic plants. So in terms of managing for reproduction, the recommendations are to, to achieve high pregnancy rates and to um, make sure that we're attaining reasonable um, or adequate uh, ewe welfare. Sheep should not fall below a condition score of two um, or you're going to end up with um, an increasing, a vastly increasing number of um, non-pregnant ewes. Um, performance is likely to be better in terms of um, twinning rate if they uh, increase uh, condition score above two, um, but that there is a bit of variation between uh, strains and breeds in in at to what score um, there's going to be continued increases. It is critical to maintain the condition of use during late pregnancy uh, if we're going to try to um, optimise lamb survival. Okay, so um, that's just about um, make sure you're, you're increasing the feed as pregnancy, pregnancy advances so that the ewes are actually maintaining their own uh, condition. In terms of RAM percentages, people use a um, whole range of values for various reasons. Um, as a generalisation, 1% RAMs for adult ewes and 2% for maiden ewes or if you're using short joinings um, generally gives um, good results. Um, do think about RAM preparation for at least two months pre-joining because that's how long sperm production takes and that means increasing nutrition of RAMs to, to boost sperm production. Optimum performance of RAMs is obtained in condition score three. Shade is important in terms of reducing um, heat stress in RAMs and, and maintaining their fertility. Um, make sure they're disease free and, and um, preventive treatments such as, you know, um, prevention of fly strike is, is um, is conducted so that they're um, uh, they're not going to get um, some sort of disease that makes them break down, and, and sound. Um, um, so rams are the thing that um, is critical to getting performance, um, as well as um, maintaining um, uh, the ewes in good condition. And even for you ewes, um, adequate shade, as we heard from uh, Gordon this morning, is important, and it's also uh, during hot conditions a, a, a welfare requirement. Um, typically, people use trees um, because they don't cost much, although um, fencing off of trees to prevent ring barking of trees in containment areas is important. Um, but some form of shade um, should be provided um, uh, during hot weather um, because it will um, um, uh, improve the welfare of the sheep and may well increase your reproductive performance. Um, and clearly, clean water is important um, with up to 10 litres of, of water per day per sheep um, in hot weather. Um, there is a lot of stuff we uh, we don't know about containment and, and, and its effect on reproduction. And some of those things are what is the optimal mob size and pen design? How much shade is needed? Do we need more than what was already out there? Uh, and what the best feeding practices are? So those are all areas for uh, further research before we can give solid recommendations. Um, um, as part of addressing some of those, I'm currently running a survey uh, which is aimed to identify where the risks are and what uh, the optimum practices uh, might be, which increase lamb marking rates um, for containment or supplementary fed use. Um, so I've got that survey link there, and I'd really appreciate if um, if people could find the time to, to fill in that survey, because um, that will actually help us to... Um, Work out what um, what practices give better results, uh, and therefore we can we can um, hopefully give better recommendations in the future. Um, so yeah, any questions? We seem to have lost Kayla there. Thanks, Susan. All right, I'll just turn myself off then if I no one has I, a question. I think it's I think it's on to me. There's a couple of things in the chat there you can have a look at. Oh. I think we need to move on for time. So. Okay. I'll thank you, Susan, and start my presentation. Um, so uh, I can almost say good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just waiting for my presentation to come up. Uh, better say good morning, it's 11.59. Good morning. Uh, I'm just going to talk to you very briefly about the Sheep Sustainability Framework. If you haven't heard about the Sheep Sustainability Framework, 
uh, that's because it doesn't exist yet. And we're just in the development of the sheep sustainability sustainability framework. You may be aware of the beef sustainability framework, which has been up and running for approximately three years and has delivered there a report last week. Um, and there is information, uh, relatively limited information by MLA and AWI. Uh, so it's it's a joint initiative and it includes both the wool and the sheep meat sector of the industry. The framework will report on the performance of the sheep industry in terms of its sustainability performance against priorities and indicators. And we're right at the stage of setting those priorities and identifying what indicators okay. will occur. The, the aim is to develop transparency and trust with stakeholders, sustainability uh, and showing that the industry is sustainable in terms of environment, in terms of animal care, in terms of social responsibility, and in terms of our economic viability is really important for our stakeholders. Um, and the framework potentially will identify things that need improving, and equally it will also uh, presumably identify areas that we're doing very well in. And it will be used to guide investment for R&D. Uh, in issues that are identified around sustainability. So it, it's certainly very important, particularly for the customer base, it's becoming more and more important that we can uh, let everyone know what we're doing in terms of sustainability and our story. Uh, this is a, a bit overdone slide, but the, uh, and, and probably makes those points I've already made. I, I just wanna make the point here that it's not about what's uh, it's all about what's happening on individual farms, but it's not about individual farm reporting. It's about giving a, a picture of what's happening across the industry to our both internal and external stakeholders. So it will use existing levels of information and bring those together in a report. And it is aimed at being the uh, an accurate reporting of what's going on, not designed to move the industry in a particular direction. Once we get those figures, that may well move things in a particular direction, but that's not the objective of the framework. The framework is to present the information so that people can judge uh, how the sheep industry is performing. The other uh, issue at the moment is where the, the boundary will be. Initially, the focus of the framework will be mostly on farm and while the animals are alive. Uh, we won't be going down as the beef framework does does further down the uh, value chain at this stage, but our commitment is that over one to three years, we will go all the way down the chain. The reason we're not going down the chain is we think it's very important initially to get highly accurate and credible information. We think we can do that within Australia and uh, from our farm sector. We're not uh, uh, convinced that we're able to do that with overseas processing and in terms of wool in particular a lot of that occurs overseas at this stage so initially we're going to walk before we run and we will concentrate on the uh, on-farm sector as I've mentioned we're, the, the themes that we'll be doing mirror the dairy and the beef uh, themes are around our sheep our environment our people and our businesses so they're the four themes that we'll be dealing with. And just in terms of where we're up to, uh, we're up to the uh, second stage consultation. The third stage consultation will occur at the end of this month or the beginning of next month, which involves online public consultation. So anyone who has uh, any input uh, interest or wants to just see what's going on, I would encourage you to keep out an eye out for the online public consultation. And just in um, what, what does it mean for you? Well, right at the moment, it doesn't mean much, but be involved in this consultation. Uh, sustainability is really important to the industry. Uh, we're in high-end markets, there's high consumer expectation and we need to keep improving and demonstrating our progress. And through this framework, this is what we, we're aiming to achieve. So thank you very much. I think Dean will be uh, unmiking and Dean's uh, filling in for Susan and he's going to be presenting on livestock as key drivers of soil carbon sequestration in the rangelands. So thank you, Dean. Good one. Thanks, Bruce. And I hope everyone can hear me through, through this. 
Um, yeah, I'm Suze Orgul in disguise today. Uh, I want to give you a quick update on a piece of work we're doing together in collaboration between New South Wales DPI where Suze works and Select Carbon where I work. The context for the work is uh, in the rangelands but could be applicable to a more intensive agricultural system as well where um, historical or current high, graze, high total grazing pressure combined with extreme events sets us up for, at, for risk, for being at risk of soil degradation, loss of, loss of perennial grasses and poor landscape function. And so this piece of work is look, looking to explore practical management options to increase soil condition. And the shorthand for soil condition in this context is carbon and cover. Soil carbon, building soil carbon and improving uh, soil ground cover. And in so doing, make better use of, uh, ev of every drop of rainfall. What I want to just focus on in the next couple of minutes is the role of livestock in that. And we often think of livestock as the, if you like, the takers from the system. They ultimately draw uh, on and extract the nutrients that come from the soil and the ground cover. But well-managed livestock can be a very cost-effective and effective uh, tool in landscape repair uh, through multiple ways, including these three. Controlled hoof, Im hoof impact, creating little uh, pits for collecting water, seeds and nutrients through their manure, redistributing uh, seeds and nutrients uh, and building soil microbial activity. Often the organic substrate is missing from a lot of our soils and the uh, distribution of manure across the landscape can be a very important part to stimulate soil microbial activity. And of course, um, livestock have potential to influence vegetation composition. And the really important message is that we can manipulate and control each of these elements. Uh, and that's very important as a time and space element where are they, how many, uh, how many, where are the livestock, how many livestock and how long are they there in a given location. And I just want to give you a couple of very quick examples of demonstrating that it's within our powers to manipulate that even in ex extensive landscapes. This is a hundred hectare paddock uh, in, on a pastoral property in Western Australia where we used a mobile lick feeder as an attractant to concentrate grazing um, pressure uh, for very short periods of time in, in a relatively um, large area. Small for them, but large for some, for some other operators. The bottom left photograph shows you where the mobile lick feeder was positioned for just three days. So the impact at that site was very controlled. And even in that site, you come back a year later and the photographs on the right-hand side shows us that there's an increase um, in diversity in the annual and perennial grasses that um, appeared in those areas where there was concentrated grazing activity. But equally, the benefits on the paddock were more extensive and not just around where the lick feeder was, but on how they utilised the other feed resources in the paddock. But being mobile um, was very important here. Being a lick feeder also, because it, we could, could control how much the animals ate and therefore how much we spent but not leaving uh, a self feeder in one location, but moving it around is a very important strategy because we can control the impact of the animals. Um, here's an example um, as well uh, from a larger paddock. Um, this happens to be on a pastoral property in, use in the Northern Territory. The brighter the colour shows where um, the livestock spent most of the time. So we GPS tracked the animals, uh, nine square kilometres, so you know, about three k's by three k's in this paddock. The image on the left shows that they spent most of the time around the centre of the paddock in a historically overused area and a bit of time down the bottom pointy end of the paddock, which is where the single water point was located. Then over a series of weeks, uh, and we ran the trial for um, several months uh, without having time to, to go into detail of how we did it, but using nutrition and behavioural tools and tactics of self-herding, we drew grazing away from the overused area in the centre of the paddock and concentrated grazing over time in areas of the paddock that were historically underused or in fact sometimes never used. So through practical and low cost strategies, we can manipulate where animals spend time and therefore turn them from um, a, a contributor to degradation to a tool to remedy it. Um, the project that we're working on is evaluating soil carbon uh, uh, strategies to, to improve soil carbon and livestock is one of them but not the only one. So we're working with, with producers, um, existing networks 
building on what we know from a science space, but also very much couched in the context of practical tools that people can use in extensive landscapes without spending a lot of money. So grazing, controlling total grazing pressure, controlling the distribution and how long animals spend in locations within a paddock, uh, water spreading, ponding banks um, are also included, and looking at ways that manipulating the vegetation competition, uh, composition through grazing management can all be tools to build uh, soil carbon profile through improving ground cover. And in so doing, um, really very strongly trying to align it to current production goals and values. Whereabouts in these extensive landscapes is it cost effective to implement these strategies? What's the response? What's the level of response we can expect in soil carbon and ground cover? And therefore provide meaningful information about what does it do to the profitability of the production business, the sustainability over time, and does it create opportunities for you as a producer to participate uh, in the carbon farming market and diversify your income and provide a new set of options to you that you may not have previously considered. Thanks, Kayla, back to you. Okay, sorry, uh, Dean, it's Tony here. I've just jumped in because we've got a few technical glitches with Kayla's internet. Um, so thank you, hoping everyone can hear me okay. Um, so have we got any questions? I'm just looking up the Q&A panel. All right, well, uh, we... I don't think there's any questions in the chat. So given the no. time, we might, we might move back to the main session. Yeah, so if everybody can just go up to the top right hand corner with those three little dots, exit the webinar, go back to the main landing screen and, um, and then you can select that final session. So we'll see you in there in a moment.